hear it. Will you talk to the lady in the front row? No, no, I got her attention. Also go uh, <coughs> rustle people in. Yeah. <laughs> As it goes, don't you? If we could uh, start the lecture for uh, those of you who don't know me, I, I'm Arnold Belker. I was a student of Dr. Cheng's, and uh, those of us who knew him and loved him uh, went, went to organize this lecture. Dr. Cheng attended St. John's University which was a Western-style school in Shanghai, China, for his undergraduate and MD degrees. He interned in, a, a, it would be the PG-1 now, in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, 
when he, uh, he then went to uh, be a resident at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx, then he was chief resident in Atlantic City. He was not able to return to China because of the communist takeover, and he ended up in the States. And it's of interest, his father had obtained a PhD at the University of Chicago around 1920. Uh, I, I, that always amazed me. Uh, Dr. Ching was a GI fellow at New England Medical Center, which is Tufts Associated uh, in Boston. He remained on the staff there until 57. He met and married his wife, Melvia Lee, who's here with us today. She was a dietitian at New England Medical Center. He came here with Malcolm Stanley, who was uh, head of the gastroenterology division at uh, the University of Louisville when they moved here in uh, 57. Actually, I think it was 56. Then he was in private practice in Louisville uh, from 73 until he retired in 92. Sam uh, had the professional attributes of being a highly ethical, having highly ethical standards, thereby resulting in this lectureship uh, on uh, medical ethics. He was an outstanding teacher. Uh, he had logical thought processes. He was disciplined and modest. He loved the ponies, although I must say I don't think he was a good handicapper. <laughs> uh, he loved Tangeray martinis. Uh, he had a wonderful sense of humor. His uh, uh, family you see on your left, son Steve, who's not with us today, uh, wife Melvia, who is, uh, then Dr. Chang, son Jim, who's with us, daughter Cindy, who's with us, and uh, with us also today is Cindy's husband, uh, Ambassador Henry Crumpton, who is, uh, Hank was uh, uh, President Bush's U.S. Ambassador for Counterterrorism. It's, uh, it was because of, of uh, Dr. Cheng that uh, Ted Lynch and I went to intern uh, at the university, uh, for the hospital from which he came here. Uh, uh, the other organizers of this lecture are Sid Markham, who can't be with us today, and uh, Dr. Charlie Smith, who also was unable to be here today. I, I'll turn the program over now to Dr. Eli Pendleton. Hello and welcome again. My name is Eli Pendleton. I'm with the Department of Family and Geriatric Medicine. I want to welcome everyone to the fall 2015 Samuel Chang Lecture in Humanities and Medicine. Um, before I introduce Dr. Elder, one point about CME credit. Hopefully everyone got one of these face sheets at the front. Um, please make sure that you call that number. If you haven't already registered, you will be registered by the end of today. You may then call in between 5 and midnight. I know that seems a little tight. Um, and if you call that number and give that code, then you will be given your credit. If you're already registered, it, it, you should be able to just go ahead and do so. Today we have the uh, fine pleasure of hearing from Dr. Nancy Elder. Dr. Elder did her medical degree <clears throat> at the University of Minnesota, followed by a family medicine residency at Good Samaritan Medical Center. Uh, she then did an academic development fellowship at University of Missouri in Columbia. She's worked in all corners of the United States, settled in Cincinnati um, about a couple decades ago, I believe. Um, she is very well uh, respected within the area of medical humanities, um, very well published, and has been giving many presentations, much like you'll hear today. She's here today to discuss medical errors and how they impact physicians and patients. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Elders. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me? Okay, yeah. Nobody's ever accused me of being uh, quiet. So um, thank you very much. Um, I am a family doctor um, from just upriver um, in Cincinnati, and I am 
pleased and honored uh, to have been asked to come and speak to you today in Dr. Cheng's name. Um, we're going to talk about medical errors. Um, I'm a primary care doc, so I'm probably not going to spend a lot of time talking about horrible things that happen in the hospital, but everything I'm going to talk about, you can apply to whatever field you are in or whatever field you're going to go into, because most of them are, are larger concepts. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about what, what we need to do after errors. But we're going to start off by saying, well, first of all, I would like to know if everybody in the room who's never made a mistake anywhere in your life could please raise your hand. Not even one person. You know, usually there's one person in every crowd that raises their hands that I've never made a mistake. Um, usually some, you know, wannabe teenage boy, but um, enough about my son. Uh, it reminds me of my father. My father used to say to me, I only made one mistake in my life, and that's when I thought I was wrong, but I wasn't. So um, we know that everybody makes mistakes. And why would we think we're not going to make a mistake when we practice medicine? We are. Why talk about primary care? Why talk about that? Well, for the most part, in a given month, in any given month, less than one person per 1,000 is going to be hospitalized in an academic center. Okay. About eight per 1,000 are going to be hospitalized in a community hospital, but about 113 out of 1,000 are going to visit a primary care doctor. That's where patients are going. They see, we have most of our contact with patients in the ambulatory outpatient setting. And Americans have a lot of exposure there. Pediatricians, family physicians, general internists, geriatricians, these are the kinds of people that are my kind of people. And that's basically where I'm going to aim this from. But like I said, we're talking about all kinds of errors. So I'm going to start out a little bit to get us all on the same wavelength to let you know what I mean by medical error. Then we're going to talk about what we know about what patients and families want when they have experienced an error. What are the barriers to us as healthcare providers in disclosing those errors? The big thing we need to talk about is what is that relationship between disclosure and malpractice, because it's, it's, it's the big elephant in the room. And then talk about ways, what are the best ways for us to talk to patients when medical errors have occurred. Okay, so, oops. I'm going to start out with a quick primer and just get everybody on the same page. If you know medical errors, if you read the literature, this will probably be redundant. Probably one of the most common definitions, the ones we think about the most, is one that was written by James Reason. He was a British error researcher. He was not a medical researcher. And he talked about either the correct action does not proceed as intended, what he called an error of execution, or the original intended action is not correct what he called an error of planning. For example, if I know that you are allergic to penicillin, and then I go ahead and prescribe you amoxicillin, I have done an error of execution. I never should have prescribed that. On the other hand, if I decide that we need to get a certain radiology test done, and I order the test, and for whatever reason, you don't get the test done. Maybe the order never makes it to the right radiology center, and you're out in the, in the rural area. The original action was correct, but it didn't get done. He would call that an error of planning. Um, Sue Dovey, uh, a researcher in primary care, came up with this definition to try and make that be more practical on a day-to-day -day basis. And she said, anything that happened in my office, and you can substitute unit or center or ward, that shouldn't have happened and that I absolutely do not want to happen again. Albert Wu, another researcher in errors, talked about a commission or omission that would have been judged wrong by peers at the time it occurred. And notice he did put in that time it occurred because we don't want to bring into this uh, hindsight or outcome bias when we know what already happened. Um, and it's not just things we do wrong, it's things we don't do. So I think if you put all these together, you have a pretty good sense of what we mean when we talk about medical error. Adverse event, another important word. Adverse event is the injury resulting from a medical intervention or medical management of a patient. Sometimes they are unpreventable. 
If we prescribe chemotherapy to a woman for breast cancer, she will lose all her hair. That hair loss, that nausea, those are adverse events. She wouldn't have had that happen to her unless we gave her the medicine. But they are unpreventable, and we plan for those. On the other hand, when my patient breaks out in hives because I prescribed them amoxicillin when I knew they were allergic to penicillin, that is preventable. That should not have happened. That was due to error. Okay. I like this, what Wu said. Patients, however, tend to define error much more broadly than healthcare professionals. The patient definition may intend communication problems, disrespect, lack of caring or compassion, and non-preventable adverse events, as well as medical errors. So when we talk about errors with our patients, we need to make sure that we may not be talking about the same thing. And we need to have that conversation. All right, how do they all fit together? So if we start at the top, if we start with harm and bad outcomes and we kind of look backward to what caused it, sometimes it's from the disease process. Okay, bad thing happened because of your disease. Sometimes it's because we did something medically, but it was unpreventable. Only sometimes is it due to that medical error that led to that preventable adverse event. So not all bad things that happen to patients are due to medical error. And the other way around, when we make mistakes, when we make a medical error, thank goodness, many times we do not have patient harm that comes from that. Sometimes it does, but sometimes there are barriers. Sometimes I get a phone call from the pharmacist at CVS that says, did you really mean to prescribe amoxicillin because this patient is allergic to it? And I'm like, thank you very much. Let's switch that over to something else. So sometimes there are people who catch our errors for us. Sometimes it's the patient who catches it. You know, doctor, it's always been a pink pill that I've taken for the last two and a half years, and now it's a blue pill. You know, it is, is it supposed to be? Did they just change brands, or did you write the wrong dose of the medicine? And sometimes, I don't know, it's luck. You know, it's the moon rising in Aquarius on a Tuesday in May. I don't know why sometimes we do something wrong. We make a mistake and our patient doesn't get harmed. Thank goodness that sometimes happens. So not all the mistakes we make will lead to harm. In fact, in primary care where I live, most of them, thank goodness, will not lead to harm. But remember where I said we see so many patients and we have so many interactions? Even when not very many of our patients, of our errors lead to harm, there's a lot of patients and a lot of errors. Medical error is a process. If you can't remember listening, it's what we do. The preventable adverse event is the outcome. But just like patients have a broader definition of error than we do, a lot of times we use the terms medical error and preventable adverse event interchangeably. And people will talk about a medical error as being the bad outcome that happened. So that's like where we call anything that's respiratory the flu. You know, as physicians, we know influenza virus is actually a very specific thing, but we talk about the flu with lots of different things. Well, sometimes we talk about medical error for things that in a research point of view or a written point of view, we would be more narrow about. So I just wanted to make sure that we're going to use them sort of interchangeably. Because I'm going to tell you about a story. When I um, first uh, came to Cincinnati in uh, uh, 2001, and uh, shortly after I started at the practice I was at then, I saw a patient who was very similar to this patient. Um, she was concerned she might be pregnant because she had missed her last period, and she so did not want to be pregnant. Okay. Her pregnancy test was negative. Reviewing the chart, which at the time was a paper chart, found a thyroid test from six months ago that was abnormal. It was very, very high, the TSH, which meant her thyroid level was very, very low. No one had ever notified the patient in the last six months or treated her for her low thyroid. There was a little note that said, tried to call the patient, no answer, and then it got filed away and left. So how does the physician deal with this? She could say, good news, you're not pregnant. In fact, your thyroid's low, and we're going to be able to fix that. Or maybe she would say, I'm glad to say you're not pregnant, but we made a mistake. And we never told you that your test results from April were abnormal. Your thyroid is low, and the delay in treatment has caused you to miss your period. Let's be honest, the first one's a little easier to do. 
And the second one is a lot harder to do. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. And this was a real patient, and I really had to tell her we screwed up and had not told her her thyroid level for six months. Okay. Well, what do patients want? What do patients want when they believe that a medical error has happened in their care or that they have an adverse event? Well, there's been lots of studies about that, interviews, looking at histories, surveys, lots of things. We know overwhelmingly patients and families desire full disclosure of all errors. What do we mean by that? National Survey of the Public, 89% said that physicians should be required to tell patients when errors are made. Focus groups of patients, some um, in uh, 2003, they were unanimous that all errors that cause harm, a little bit different here, should be disclosed, and they wanted a detailed explanation, and they wanted an apology. Survey of emergency room patients in North Carolina, 88% of them wanted to know any error that occurred during their care. The other 12% only mattered to them if there was harm involved. So we are know that they really want that full disclosure. Here's a survey of the specific parts of the disclosure. Okay. You can tell everything's like really high, above 90 almost. They want to be told of the error even if they're not harmed. You know, 10% only didn't. 100% of them want to be told as soon as the error is discovered. They want to know recurrences are being prevented. They want to know the details of what happened. And they want the doctor to express a sincere apology. All right. So they want an apology. They want someone to take responsibility. They want an explanation of what happened. And they want to know it won't happen again. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? Okay. But what's really happening? I'll bet it's not all of those things. When we look into the literature of the 90s and the early 2000s, when we started talking about this, the most significant medical mistake of the year, 22% of trainees, only 22%, discussed it with the patient or the family. Another study, 21% of practicing physicians, only 21% discussed it with the patient or the family. Another study, this time we asked the patients who felt they had been injured due to medical treatment. They noted that only 21% of them reported a staff responsibility and only 27% were offered an apology. Let's move into the next decade. Maybe things are getting better. In 2002, 33% of those patients who experienced a medical error reported receiving an apology. And a most recent survey of house staff, 55% said yes, they would disclose to a patient if there was harm involved. We're moving the needle slowly but surely, but it's certainly not anything universal. But for patients, you know, they're going to suspect something if it's, they're not feeling right, they're not getting better. Non-disclosure does not prevent patients from suspecting that an error occurred. What our patients might do if they think that you made a mistake and you're not talking to them about it, they may seek care elsewhere. They may obtain a second opinion. They may seek advice from family and friends who have medical experience. I'll bet some of you have actually been on the end of a phone call from a neighbor or a friend saying, such and such did show to me this doctor, and this is what happened. Do you think they made a mistake? Or was that the right thing to do? Many of us play that role. Patients are going to increase their suspicion. And patients who believe they have suffered from errors do not always come to you and say, you know, I just don't think I should be feeling this way, or I don't think my right leg should have been cut off when my left leg was the one that we were going to have the operation on. They're not going to always voice their beliefs to you. They may suffer in silence. They may not let you correct their misperceptions. And they, you have a chance to say, you know, this was a possibility. This happens sometimes just from the disease or just from the treatment. We did nothing that I would count as an error. But if we don't have that conversation with our patients, we're not going to know. And if there was an error, we're not going to be able to say, oh, my goodness, you should not be taking that medication any longer. We really need to change that unless we can have that conversation. So why don't we disclose our errors besides the obvious, which is legal and insurance fears? That's that's there. 
Maybe communication fears. Maybe we're afraid we're not good at communicating this stuff. We don't know what to say. Will it really make a difference? And can I make things worse for the patient and for myself if I actually disclose the error? Let's talk about legal fees. Okay, number one, across the board, reason why physicians do not disclose is the fear of litigation, the fear of being sued. It's the number one reason. They're also concerned about their reputation. You know, what are people going to think of me, both in my peers, in the practice, or in the academic community? They're concerned they may even lose their privileges, which could lead to losing some of their income. Their risk management, well, I was, you know, am I still going to be able to keep my insurance? What's going to happen here? So a lot of these things are concerns that stand in the way of physicians disclosing to patients. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this one because it is the most important. Bottom line, will disclosure affect litigation? We do know that the absence of disclosure may drive litigation to find out what happened. There is a lot of good evidence that when physicians are closed-mouthed about what happened, patients go to other extremes to find out, and sometimes they go to the legal system. Patient dissatisfaction with physicians' communication and interpersonal skills was a common reason for going to the litigation. Patients pursued malpractice claims because they wanted information about what happened. They were concerned the physician might be doing a cover-up. It may have been some, not even an error, but if they thought it was and they couldn't get an answer, this was where they went. In fact, one study, 91% of those pursuing medical negligence stated that desire for the explanation was a reason or at least part of the reason for doing it. And a significant number of those said, you know, an apology and an explanation would have stopped me from going forward with legal action. We know that if the outcome, the harm that the patient had is serious, that, of course, patients are much more likely to seek legal advice. But as the foes, the answer to the question, will disclosure affect litigation? We really don't know. All of this is not causal data. It is not cause and effect data. But no studies have provided the causal relationship between disclosure or non-disclosure and litigation. It's kind of your expert opinion based on a lot of epidemiological data and survey data that we have that's basically going to say probably disclosure will not lead to increased litigation and non-disclosure may decrease litigation. But that has a big asterisk next to it telling you it's not an evidence-based statement. One of the ways people have tried to deal with this is, well, let's get a law on the books that says I can say I'm sorry and I made a mistake and you can't use that against me should it go to litigation. We call those apology and disclosure laws. And over the last 20 years, many, many more of these have come up. The aim is to protect aspects of that provider conversation with the patient to not have it used as evidence should that liability or that come into a lawsuit. And because a lot of physicians will say, I'd love to tell you what happened, I'd love to tell the patient I'm sorry, but then when they sue me, I'm going to go to court and they're going to say, Dr. Jones said that she was sorry and she did it. So these laws are there saying, gosh, let's take that out of the conversation. Disclosure laws means that if you inform the patient that an unanticipated outcome, that's such law, lawyerly talk, huh, has occurred along with some explanation, that if you do that with your patient, that will not be allowed to be used as evidence against you if you do get sued. An apology law is an expression of sympathy, plus or minus, depending on the state, for error and outcome. If you say you're sorry to the patient, it cannot be used in court as, um, as that you are admitting fault. Okay. 34 states and the District of Columbia have apology laws, nine have disclosure laws, six have both, 13 have neither, including the great state of Kentucky, which is silent on the issue. In Ohio, where I come from, we do have an apology law. However, most of the laws are really bad. Um, they are ambiguous or they have significant weaknesses. Most laws do not require and they do not protect the key information that patients want communicated with them. 
These are laws that, the apology laws, for example, protect a physician from saying, I'm sorry you are hurt. I did not hear any, ex, you know, responsibility in that law. So they only cover the expression of sorrow. I'm sorry that you had to go to the ICU. I'm sorry the leg got cut off. Most of these are in the passive case, in case you noticed. It's not like, I'm sorry I cut off the wrong leg. It's sorry the leg got cut off, like it happened miraculously. So the trouble with apology and disclosure laws is they probably need to be a whole lot better written. They are not the panacea to this issue. Um, and we don't know whether or not they're going to increase disclosure or decrease malpractice suits. They have not been around that long. Okay, so what about your system? We practice in system, and so maybe if we had a better system that would do this, like our healthcare system, most hospital systems, the automatic response is deny and defend. Even if it's obvious that a stupid mistake was made, the hospital predominantly or the healthcare system said, we will deny it and we will defend it because that's our basic line. We may choose to do something different, but our front line is always deny and defend. Um, a patient safety model, of course, would be, you know what, we're actually going to seek out and evaluate the root causes of preventable adverse events and even unpreventable ones because we want to know more about the errors. And when we're at fault, we're going to admit it, and we're going to offer an apology and probably an appropriate financial restitution. Your neighbor right down the street, the Lexington VA, was probably the first hospital system to start doing this. Now, I realize VAs are totally different than the rest of the world. Um, but they have a record, and they started doing this. They started saying, you know, when we find an error, we are actually going to go knock on the patient's and the patient's family's door and say, we believe an error was made in your care. Bring your lawyer. We need to talk about it, rather than waiting for the patient to come to them. University of Michigan has published a lot of work on what they do with this new system, and they have found a steady reduction in the number of claims and various other metrics, such as the elapsed time for processing claims, defense costs, and average settlement amounts. So a lot of the larger healthcare systems around the country are finding we need to move away from assuming the first thing we do is deny and defend into saying we need to actively investigate on our own all of these adverse events and the ones where we really made an error or somebody who works for us made an error, we need to move forward with apology, disclosure, and appropriate financial restitution. So that's another way to deal with it. Okay. I'm going to move from the legal system, and I'm going to talk about talking to patients. Because in a bottom line, that's what we're talking about doing. You have to sit down with the patient and their family and have a communication. What are the barriers to us doing that? Part of it is we're not confident about our skills to do that. And especially younger physicians and physicians in training, oh my goodness, trying to have that conversation is a really scary thing. We're good at self-deception. It wasn't really that bad. If the nurse had seen I'd written the wrong medicine and not given it to her, maybe it wouldn't have happened, you know? Or maybe I just feel so bad about myself. I cannot believe I did such a stupid thing. I don't even want to share it with anybody. What about the cultural appropriateness, okay? I mean, not all my patients are like me. Some of them are immigrants. Some of them come from a culture of having been taken advantage of. Are they going to believe me or are they just going to think you know, that this is another example of how their group of people has been taken advantage of. And I don't even know what I'm really supposed to say. This is very confusing. Um, and you know what? It wasn't just me. The nurse was involved and the medical assistant. We had three medical students and two residents. And don't forget the surgical consult. Whose job is it? So a lot of things we don't know about. Okay. I think a really key thing and a really nice study that came out is no matter what you say, the patient may hear something else. Okay. Are any of you married? Okay. I say many things to my husband that he swears I never said. And sometimes he says things to me that I'm sure that was not what he meant. So the perception is very important, and it is very important in this conversation. Um, and that's somebody, you know, who I live with and know pretty well. What about the cross-cultural things? Cross spiritual disciplines. I may come from a spiritual discipline where confession is good for the soul, and you may come from a different discipline that thinks if I'm confessing, there must be something wrong with me. 
um, cross generations. You know, you have a 25-year-old, you know, resident trying to talk to some 87-year-old. There may not be the same communication and understanding. Okay. Um, this nice study by Wu in 2009 found that patient perceptions were based on more than just words. They did a lot of little videos that they had people watch. And even though it was very clear in the video that the doctor was, you know, disclosing and apologizing, I am sorry that I did this bad thing, if the patient perceived that the doctor wasn't truthful or honest, what they felt about the whole situation was more with their perception than the actual words that were said, which makes a lot of sense. How do we make our patients know it's more than just words? Okay. Well, one thing is body language much, must match the words. You know, if you're walking out the door and you're saying, oh, by the way, get really sorry about that mix-up with the medication. Um, yeah, sorry that happened. And then walk out, that probably does not strike anybody as a real apology. Um, and you need to make sure the message is understood, just like we do with, you know, teach back, ask back, read back, depending on where your outcome things. So this is what I am telling you about what happened. Okay. The insulin got given to you as 100 units instead of 10 units. And that's why you ended up in the emergency room. You know, that's why you ended up in the ICU. Do you understand, you know, this part of it? Okay, you read it back to me. Yes, I got... Ten times too much insulin. Okay, now let's go on to the next step. You know, I'm the idiot who wrote that. No, just so whatever it is, you make sure that it's understood. And you're going to have to deliver the message more than once. This is very analogous to giving bad news. And people need to hear it more than once because their minds stop hearing sometimes after certain words. Um, we do know that physicians, interestingly enough, in that study, who accepted responsibility, it is my fault you got the wrong insulin dose but did not also say, and I'm really sorry, okay? They did not like that the patients had very negative judgments of the people who would accept responsibility but not offer an apology. So both pieces are very necessary. Okay, is it even going to make a difference? Is it going to make a difference in whether or not my patients trust me or leave me? We talked a little bit about litigation risk already. Am I going to make the patient even worse? Am I going to just stress them out? And you know what? Medicine is complicated. They're never going to understand, you know, about the way this medication interacted with that medication, and it's just way too complicated for patients. Not really. First of all, is it really going to affect the doctor-patient relationship? Are patients going to walk out on you when they find out you screwed up? Some of them probably will, to be honest. Others are probably going to want to stay there. We know that if the patient thinks you made a mistake and you don't talk to them about it, much de more decreased trust and satisfaction. Um, we know that non-disclosure of error is associated with lower patient satisfaction, less trust in the physician, and more negative emotional responses. That's when patients have had a mistake happen to them, have had harm, and nobody discloses it to them. They're not satisfied. They don't trust that doctor. And yet, in other studies where the doctors did disclose errors to the patients, patients were actually more likely to continue to see the physician. They actually felt reassured, and they had an increased trust in the physician's honesty. So is disclosing an error going to harm the doctor-patient relationship? probably is going to do just the opposite. It's probably going to improve that relationship. Um, it's that unexpected breakdown when all of a sudden, if you're a, a doctor who's told the patient lots of things and been a good communicator and then you stop communicating, that's probably not the best thing to do, and that is going to make the family suspect error. So will you lose some patients? Yes, I think you will especially when the harm is really, really serious. But for the most part, with minor um, seriousness and other errors, you will actually improve the doctor-patient relationship by disclosure. Okay. But can I make it worse if I disclose? Are there instances where maybe I shouldn't? Well, theoretically, if a patient never suspected that you made a mistake, all right, if you told them you made a mistake, they may trust you less and they may be more distressed about the quality of care they're giving. That assumes they never suspected a thing. 
And to tell you the truth, most patients do. The other thing we have to look at is whether or not, even if they don't suspect, is it ethically the right thing to do? And I would say, and most people who write on this would say, that the ethical imperative still impels a full disclosure to the patient who suffered preventable harm. And that basing disclosure on whether the patient was aware of the error or not is ethically indefensible. We cannot do that. I said defensible. It's consistent with, that should have been not, there we go. I didn't miss the knot. I thought I mis miswrote it. Consistent with standards such as those from the Joint Commission, the AMA, and probably most of your specialty bodies. Studies overwhelmingly show a positive or neutral effect on the doctor-patient relationship, trust in the physician, and willingness to stay with the physician when disclosure occurs. Okay. So they may not love you more. They probably won't love you less for the most part. Okay, how do we do this then? I'm going to spend the last part of this talking about what is the best way for us to actually disclose an error to a patient or apologize to a patient. I will tell you the evidence is remarkably not there, okay, as to the best way to do one method over another. I will say the timing is important. Better. Early is better than later, but later is better than never, okay? So you want to do it as soon as you can, but if it's late, it's probably still okay to do it than say, ah, oh, that happened weeks or months or year ago. I don't want to bring that back up now. You know, sometimes you feel that you don't have enough information to give a complete valid explanation, in which case it's fine to put it off till later, but just make sure you come back to it. The same communication skills we teach, we practice, we role model for giving bad news, discussing difficult treatment options, they are relevant to error disclosure. You want to have that same kind of honesty, openness, keeping the patient's autonomy at the front and keeping your honesty there. People who are good at giving bad news are pretty good at error disclosure, except for the fact that when you have to give bad news to somebody about a diagnosis or something like that, we feel emotionally more for the patient. When we've made the mistake, not only do we feel bad for the patient, but we've got a lot of internal emotions as well, what we call the second victim, the person who made the mistake or has been involved in a mistake. So when we've got our emotions out of gear, when we're feeling bad, when we're feeling worthless, when we're feeling angry, when we're feeling whatever it is, it can definitely interfere with that relationship and that discussion with the patient. So do we teach it in medical school? Well, a 2013 review found that there were 19 error disclosure curricula across the country at that time. Most of them consisted of a brief single encounter, kind of combining didactics with role play, um, limited attempts to actually study or assess whether there was true change in the learner's error disclosure behavior. Other studies have shown very limited role modeling in residency and early practice by senior physicians, preceptors, attendings in this area. It has grown and greatly improved in the last 10 to 15 years from when there was none, but there is still a great need for a better curriculum for our students and our residents. Why don't we do it? We talked about some of this. Some of it is our emotional state. Okay. I feel guilty. It's hard to have a really open, honest talk with somebody when I feel really guilty and shamed and remorseful and I just am afraid of what you're going to say to me because you know what? Sometimes patients are going to be really angry at you when you tell them you just made a really big mistake about their care. And who likes to go into a conversation when you know that you're going to get anger back at you? Patients might be afraid. What does this mean? You know, can I trust you? What, can I trust the hospital? What does it mean for my health? What does it mean? So you, the physician or nurse or who's ever making this apology, and the patient are in high emotional states, and that is an extreme barrier. Okay. And then you are getting advice from all over. You're getting advice from me up here telling you all of you should definitely disclose your errors and apologize to your patients. But you know what? You may go talk to 
a department chair, a leader, an attending, your next door neighbor, your mother, and they may tell you something totally different. Okay. You go talk to an attorney, they may tell you something totally different. You go talk to the risk management in your hospital or your health system. You go talk to your malpractice insurer, they may tell you something different. You may talk to your best friend from residency and she may tell you something different. So we get different sorts of advice. Mine, of course, is the right advice in case you are confused. Um, but in the individual situation, obviously, you take all of this into account, and sometimes it serves as a barrier. Okay, so I'm going to tell you my suggestions for how you should disclose errors and apologize to patients. It's not really mine. This is all from the literature, and I've just smushed them all together. But if you want to attribute them to me, that's fine. Okay. First of all, if this is a really serious, significant, harmful error for that patient, you need to involve your insurers, your risk management, your medical team early on. All right? You don't necessarily have to you know, delay things while you wait for everybody to get on board. But a serious, harmful error to a patient, you need to have these people involved at the very beginning. All right? You should not overly delay your disclosure waiting for all those people to get together and decide what's right and have a conversation because you as the medical provider still have this responsibility, but you want them to know what's going on. If you have to, use an immediate apology with the delayed disclosure if you don't know what it is. You can say you are sorry about the harm. You can say, I but I'm afraid there was a mistake made. I'm afraid there may have been some errors, but I don't know exactly yet. There's still stuff I don't understand what happened. I don't understand what happened in the emergency room and how it related to this ward work. I, I don't understand this person's role. I'm confused about how your body reacted to this medication. I am going to find out the answers to that, and I'm going to come back and meet with you. I think I can get a lot of this information by Friday afternoon. Maybe it's in the outpatient setting. I want you to come back, bring a family member, bring a friend, bring somebody with you. If you could come back a week from Tuesday when I'm here in the office, we'll have a discussion. Okay. Now, you better be there a week from Tuesday in the office when your patient shows up. Um, early in my research, I interviewed um, a number of people who'd experienced medical errors, and one woman told the story of literally the physician going out the back door when he heard that she was in the waiting room because he did not want to talk to her. So if you have, make an appointment, make sure you keep it. That's an important thing. I don't think that would be an issue for most people. Second, take the initiative. Don't wait for the patient to call and ask you what went wrong. Okay. If you know something went wrong, you should take the initiative. Now, sometimes we don't know until the patient calls and tells us something is not right. Okay, and then you bring them in and you find out that a mistake has been made. But if you discover a mistake was made, okay, for some reason that, you know, biopsy result that was supposed to come back in a week never came back and somehow you missed it in your regular tracking of test results and now it's, my goodness, my patient, it's, it showed up here three weeks before, after it was supposed to come back and it's positive for some horrible dread disease. You know, I'm the one who's noticed the mistake, and I need to call the patient and tell her or him. Okay. So take the initiative and explain only what you know. Okay. You know, a lot of times when you um, go to medical school or residency and you are now at the big academic center, there's a little bit of disparaging about, you know, doctors out in the community who may ultimately send patients there. I uh, practiced in, I, I studied and trained in Minnesota, and we used to talk about doctors who came from West Overshoe and uh, how they never knew anything, you know, the LMDs. You know, we were told that maybe you should not be doing that. So I'm going to say that's also true when it comes to medical errors. You need to explain only what you know. You need to accept personal responsibility when appropriate. You need, you don't want to hide the errors of others but you can say, I'm going to find out more. So that's very important. If you think a doctor from another town did something wrong by the time the patient gets there, you don't want to ignore it. You want to explore it. You want to find out what happened so that you can talk to that patient. But you don't want to disparage that doctor. You say, I don't know what happened, and I'm going to try and find out for you so that we can have this conversation. You want to use non-technical language. That goes without saying. And you need to offer to investigate to find out what's missing, to find out the other information. Okay. Four. Apologize sincerely. Sit down. Look somebody in the eye 
and tell them you're really, really sorry. Don't do it standing up as you walk out of the room. State the actions that are being taken to prevent recurrences. What good does it do if you found out something wrong happened when it might happen again? Patients want this as much as they want you to tell them you're sorry and for you to accept responsibility. They're living through it. They don't want anybody else to live through it. What are you going to do so nobody else's wrong leg gets cut off? What are you going to do so nobody else gets the wrong dose of this medication from the pharmacy? So you're going to talk about what you're doing. Maybe you can have a great system in place by the time you talk to them. Maybe you're going to say, I'm not sure yet, but we've got this committee. We've got this plan. We're going to do this PDSA cycle on this QI initiative so that we don't do that again. Okay. This one's kind of number six. It's iffy. Offer appropriate financial compensation. Sometimes you are not in a position to do that because of your role. Sometimes it can be simple. I'm not going to charge you to come in for this office visit when I tell you I made a mistake. That would be nice, okay? Um, or you can say, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to refund your co-pays for the last three office visits when we, you know, had to have you come in for all this extra work because of an error that happened. You may be able to at least do it at that simple level. Um, but otherwise, you're probably going to need to work with insurers, risk management, legal staff, hospital leadership, the people who control the purse strings to really make appropriate financial uh, compensation. But you may decide it's the right thing to do, and you're going to want to be on your patient's side in that case. Oops. Ah! Ah, what did I do? Okay, there we go. So, in summary, everyone in this room who's a healthcare provider is going to make a medical mistake. The rest of you are just going to make regular mistakes. But we are all going to make mistakes, and we're going to be involved in mistakes. Either we're going to do it personally, or we're going to be part of a system that's fallible where things fall through. All of us. The tenets of our profession, as physicians, as nurses, as students, guide us towards disclosing those errors to the patients. Patients' autonomy. Patients have a right to manage their own lives and their own health, and we must be honest to help them do that. Our focus on quality and improvement of care requires us to look at things when we make mistakes and errors. The patients are our first and most important reason for doing the right thing, which is disclosing and apologizing. Barriers include the fear of litigation, the loss of your reputation, the fact you don't know how to disclose, and concern about how it's going to affect the patient and your relationship with the patient. We know from the literature that disclosure of errors to patients is actually most likely going to prevent legal action rather than cause it or have no effect on legal action. It's going to probably improve the doctor-patient relationship rather than damage it, or it will be neutral to the relationship. Patients want and deserve an expression of sorrow, a true, real expression of sorrow and apology, an explanation of what happened, a real one, truth, an acknowledgement of responsibility, which is a way of moving that explanation and your apology together, an effort so that it won't happen again. You may not be able to say, I can't guarantee it's never going to happen again, but patients at least want to know you're making some movement in that direction. When we have mistakes, it is so important, because you're all going to do it, that we know that the most important thing we can do when we make a mistake is to consider our patients, disclose to them, make apologies, and make it as right as we can possibly make it after it happens. The next most important thing, which would be a whole other lecture, is that you take care of yourself when you've had an error and made a mistake. I could only do one of these today, so I chose to focus on the patients. There's a reason that the literature calls patients the first victim of error and physicians and, and healthcare staff the second victims. And today's talk focused on the importance of us setting things right with the first victim, because I will tell you in the literature about how you set things right with yourself, apologizing and disclosing to patients is a key factor towards self-improvement and working through the distress of making errors. 
And that's all I have to say. So thank you very much for inviting me. I'm happy to take any questions or hear any comments. You can tell your horror stories. Yes, thank you. Um, there was an interesting comment in case you didn't hear about, um, and using the, the Ebola case in um, Texas as an example um, of the electronic health record facilitating and making errors. And I will say this about EHRs. When I, um, uh, for about five or ten years, I studied uh, testing process errors in primary care. You know, ordering a test, uh, sending the, you know, getting the test implemented, getting the results back to your practice, reading over the results, notifying the patients, following the patients through. Did a lot of work working with doctors and office staff 15 years ago before most of them had EMRs. Without exception, everything they said was, once we have an EMR, we won't have any of these mistakes anymore. Okay. The reality, of course, is some mistakes did go away. Different mistakes came in their stead. Okay. So electronic health records are a tool. They're a tool in our work system. Just like the people we work with, just like the organizational structure we work with, the environment within which we work, and our patients, the EMR is a tool. And if we think it as a tool, just like if you're a surgeon, you have surgical tools, they're not going to do anything by themselves. Okay. And many times, all of us know, EMRs initially kind of were designed so that we could bill at the highest rate. Let's be honest, my cynical side is coming out here, okay? They weren't necessarily put in for quality and safety, all right? Some of them have added that on. So we need to know that electronic health records have decreased some errors and increased other errors. And one of the biggest they increase is there is so much crap inside EHRs that gets moved from one place to another that most of us don't bother to read it. Is that an honest statement? Any of you who are clinicians, there's just too many pages of stuff, too many tabs to open that you just skip a lot of them. So finding the important parts in an EHR is, I think, our next step so that these kinds of things that you bring up uh, don't happen as much. So yeah, the EHR fixed some things. We have a whole different set of errors or potential errors that we need to deal with. Thanks. Any other comments, questions? Yeah. Yeah, um, and that's a really hard thing, and, and it's even harder if we're talking if there are learners involved. <laughs> you know, what if your resident discovers, you know, I, I really think my attending read that EKG wrong. <laughs> what am I supposed to do about that? Um, there's not a lot of good evidence about what to do. It's all expert opinion. Um, I like the, one of the things I talk about is explore, don't ignore, which means if you find it, you should not just close your eyes that maybe it didn't really happen. You need to find out what happened. Um, and if it's like somebody from another institution, it's whether or not you can get a hold of them. If you can't get a hold of them, then you're going to have to deal with the most amount of information that you have as you talk to the patient. If it's somebody in your institution, maybe you're, you know, the internist and the cardiologist maybe did something or vice versa and you're the cardiologist and you find out the internist did something wrong, you need to have that conversation preferably together. And if you both agree, looking through the record, you know, there probably wasn't any harm involved, probably wasn't an error, we're all happy, we can let it go. Or if both of you agree, oh my goodness, I didn't even know I made that mistake, you know, you're right, this was a mistake. We need to go to the patient together. We need to have that conversation. Where's the hard part? When you think a mistake happened and she does not think a mistake happened. And that's probably when you're going to have to go to a leadership level. 
okay? You're gonna need to bring in a medical director. You're gonna need to bring in, you know, an academia up in the upper echelons. You're gonna need to bring in a vice president. You're gonna need to bring in other people when there's a disagreement. I didn't make a mistake. Yes, you did make a mistake kind of thing. And again, keeping as the priority your patient, okay? A lot of times when we remember that the patient, the patient's care, honesty with the patient should be our priority, it kind of helps us sort out some of these difficult things. Because sometimes when we throw the patient away and we start thinking about, well, what do I want my relationship to be with my colleague? And should I talk to him this way? Or should I let this happen? How much of it should I let go? We're not talking about the patient anymore. As long as we keep that patient in the picture and think, what's right for the patient and how do we get there to make it right for the patient? I think that kind of helps us make those difficult decisions. But you're right, that's one of the hardest areas of all. That's a great story. I hope all of you heard it because there's no way I could repeat it. But the importance of, um, that, that I heard you say, the importance of, of really putting, you know, thinking like a business, thinking service excellence, thinking, you know, wanting to make things right with your client, your customer, or your patient really needs to start being much more of a priority. I definitely think it's moving that way in medicine, and we just need to continue to do that. Thank you. Well, once again, thank you all so much for coming. And once again, I thank the Chang family for the opportunity to come and talk to you. I'm very honored to have been asked. Thank you. Thank you.